So welcome to the Enterprise Agile Meetup. Uh, Mary, do you want to say a few things about the about our meetup? Sure, our meetup is um, usually monthly. It's run by these great people like Ron and Sue and me and a couple of others who have had to go to a lunch meeting today. But um, we're here to help people understand what's going on in Enterprise Agile. And it's been a community for quite a long time and quite a few people. So thank you all for joining. And then I'll let Ron introduce our host today. So uh, that my introduction is going to be very short. Uh, <laughs> Diana Diana Larson said, "Y'all need to y'all need to hear what Sue's been thinking." And Sue said, "And you also need to hear what Dennis has been thinking." So <laughs> we have Sue and Dennis with us today. I'll let you take it over, Sue. Great. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, thank you, Meetup uh, co-chairs, for hosting today's event. And everybody, thank you so much for um, being here. Let me share my screen before we get, uh, okay, let me just share it. Okay, you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So um, today we'll talk about robotics intelligence, how subsumption architecture will help us with the scaling agile. So uh, my search for how best to scale Agile ended with my encounter with Mike Biro. So I met Mike in 2016 at a meetup in New York City when he came to New York City to present his new and improved Enterprise Scrum. He made lots of changes to Enterprise Scrum so that it works for the business agility. To be honest with you, I didn't get it right away. It's, it is rather complicated. Uh, but as I, I dig more and more and more, I gain new insights. And I am particularly fascinated by how Mike used robotics subsumption architecture to solve agile scaling problems. So I hope by the end of this uh, presentation, you get a new insight into how best to scale agile at enterprise level. Hi guys, also from my side, uh, my name is Jiangyu Dennis Ozdemir. Uh, please call me Dennis because it's a lot of confusion about this name. It's a, a Turkish origin, so I'm a Turkish German citizen and uh, nowadays living in, in Brazil. And uh, yeah, thanks for having us. And I'm so happy to, to be able to talk about Mike Beadle's uh, Enterprise Scrum and Subsumption Architecture. And um, yeah, I meet I met Mike Mike Beadle in 2016, and uh, we can it's not exer, exaggeration to say that uh, this was a turning point in my agile journey. I started my agile journey in 2010 in Germany as a Scrum master and then product owner. Later on, uh, could also participate in one of the uh, first big implementations of Safe with direct uh, interactions of uh, Dean Leffingwell, who went to Germany to <laughs> show us how, how it was done and so on. Uh, but then in 2016, uh, I was invited to the Enterprise Scrum community by Mike Biedel. So uh, at that time, I was uh, posting some agile memes uh, in order to be able to discuss more about uh, this, uh, all, all these topics about agility. And uh, Mike Beadle got, got to me. Uh, this was the link where, where Mike Beadle invited me. Later on, I got also a moderator in the Enterprise Scrum uh, community. And uh, we were talking about, it was very uh, delightful for me to know Mike Beadle. And uh, we were discussing about all this uh, all these topics. And then also later, uh, he invited me to the Enterprise Scrum collaborators community, like Sue also uh, was part. And uh, so uh, we could be, uh, at, so I could have a, a deeper and a better look about the enterprise Scrum ideas. And uh, it was mainly around the 3.3 uh, version. Uh, and he's also mentioning here in, in this version about the uh, 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 collaboration about the enterprise Scrum ideas. So after I met Mike Beadle, basically after this, I only, uh, we're applying the enterprise Scrum ideas, trying to experiment and implement it with my uh, clients. And uh, the best case was 
presented in 2018 by Filippi Pontieri. Uh, he was the former CIO of Livello. He presented it at the Dev Camp. It's a big uh, uh, meetup here. Uh, and then um, he's talking actually uh, with direct citation of uh, Mike Beadle and Enterprise Scrum uh, in the first, uh, first slides of him uh, talking about uh, business agility, the concept that has impacted Livello's business. So uh, later on, we will uh, go in more details uh, to the Livello case. So thanks a lot, guys. So let's start with why use subsumption architecture. So now the first and the most important reason that you would use subsumption architecture is because of autonomy. Without autonomy, all benefits of agile is very hard to be realized. Without autonomy, agile at scale is not agile. Without autonomy, agile at scale is built on sand. It just shambles. So it's autonomy, autonomy, autonomy. Like in real estate, it's location, location, location. I believe in scaling agile, it is autonomy, autonomy, autonomy. Next, it enables all at once management. As you will see in this presentation, it enables all at once management. And this is particularly important when we trying to achieve business agility. Next is the decentralized decision-making. As you will see in this presentation, it enables each team to make its own decision as well as collaborating across the whole organization. All this enables faster time to market. Most of all, it brings synergy and alignment throughout the whole organization. As teams are automated and self-managed, they are happy. Happy teams make happy customers. And happy teams and happy customers make happy stakeholders. So lastly, why? It comes down to survival and also profit. As you will see in this presentation, what Clayton told us about what to do in the face of a disruptive innovation, you must, this, this would help you. Okay, so let's get started. Now let's first talk about types of scaling so that we have the same understanding of what we mean, what we mean by scaling. So there's no scaling when one team is working on one product, right? And we have a scaling on a product level. That is when many teams are working on one product. And then we have a scaling on a portfolio level. That's when you have a portfolio of products with each product is delivered by multiple te many teams. So now you have we have a scaling at enterprise level. That's when you have a portfolio of a product as well as other functions needed in for in a uh, in an organization such as HR and governance and all other uh, organizational needed functions. Now, I believe the biggest challenge that we have with scaling is managing interdependencies. As many teams are working together, we need to know how to integrate their work together so that they're not stepping onto each other. If this is not done very well, it leads to dependency nightmare. Dependencies eat autonomy and lack of autonomy leads to a less empowered team and less empowered teams are less committed, not accountable, and have very low team morale. All of these create bottlenecks and leads to delays. Scrum just breaks down. It just doesn't work. Now, many scaling frameworks like SAFE, less Scrum at scale, manage these dependencies using roles and meetings. But I believe that we can do much better than that. As you, I, we will show you in this presentation, use subsumption architecture to enable autonomy on the team levels, as well as collaborate across the entire organization. So let me tell you the story about how Jeff got to know about the subsumption architecture. Jeff rented out an office space to iRobotics where Professor Rodney Brook and his teams were building robots. 
and Jeff saw a robot running down the office, and he's just amazed how it all worked. So one day he asked Professor Brook, the inventor of the subsumption architecture, how it works. And he said for 30 years, they used an intelligent system to control a robot, and it was total failure. The best they came up with was a smart chess program. Then they discovered the subsumption architecture. It was a game changer. So how does a robot walk using the subsumption architecture? He said each leg has a chip. They can move a leg. And then there's a chip in the spine that coordinates the legs. And then there's a neural network chip in the head figures out what to do. Before you turn on robots, chips up legs. The chip collects the data as each level sensor sends its own data to the chip as it wanders around. There's no database, the world is data, and all data is created by sensors, Professor Brooks said. So how does robot uses subsumption architecture? This is a very simple representation to demonstrate how it works. First, there are three main roles, layers, sensors, and actuator. You see, a robot must be able to know how to avoid an object before it can wander around. Once it can wander around, it can explore the world. So in this example, we have three subsumption layers. The lowest in here is to avoid object. One above is a wander around. And then next level up is an explorer. You see, it is layered so that higher layer subsumes the lower layers. And then higher layer consumes what the lower layer produces and then does its own thing while listening to the sensors. Now, sensors send signal to all layers as it rolls. And then actuator plays very key part as well here. Actuator it enables subsumption layers to interact with the physical world and enables robot to act accordingly and appropriately to the most recent and then relevant information it receives from the sensors. You see all this actuator and sensors, layers, they all work together, replacing the role of central processor. Now let's go over Let's go over the keys to this robotic subsumption architecture. First, hierarchical subsumption layer. A complete behavior is divided into sub-behaviors with higher layers subsuming the lower layers while enabling autonomy on its own layer. Second, it's learning from its past behavior. You insert a blank chip and it records its behavior and it learns from them and it's controlled by sensors and acted by actuator based on the signal that it receives from the sensors. Sensors send the signal to all layers, enabling actuator to react immediately to the physical world. Lastly, there's no central processor. All three, subsumption layers, sensors, actuator, they all work together to respond to the signal that it gets from the physical world. Now, Jeff applied the subsumption architecture only to the team level. He really, really liked the idea of robot learning from itself. So he wanted his slow programmers to become better and better. Now, I believe real beauty of subsumption architecture is when and where a higher layer subsumes a lower layer till all parts work together like a whole. To be honest with you, I am actually quite disappointed in his approach with Scrum at scale. It doesn't utilize, utilize this beauty and essence of subsumption architecture. Instead, it divides how and what. Instead of creating an environment for teams to be autonomous, it impedes them by dividing the teams into two groups, how groups, and what? At an enterprise level. I'm not talking about at a product level. This is in a, on, at an enterprise. So now Mike's approach of using the subsumption architecture is all the way. You, he applies it, we apply it end level and to the whole organization. 
and then sensors and actuator function of the subsumption architecture as well. So uh, my um, ideally, Mike said, ideally all hierarchy is in subsumption. So now hierarchy is not necessarily an evil, it's done right. In fact, we need a hierarchy to break down the complexity into more manageable units. If we apply the subsumption architecture, we will be able to have an autonomy where it belongs and enable multiple teams to work together like a big scrum team, well, almost. So let's take a look at how you can apply the subsumption architecture one by one. So first, subsumption layers. So what kind of sub subsumption hierarchy would make sense? How would you divide into subgroup so that higher layer subsumes the lower layer while enabling autonomy on its own layer? Let's do this as a bottom-up approach. First, you develop features and services providing value proposition. Next, you have a customer segment layer providing multiple value propositions. One level up, you have a business unit where it subsumes the customer segment layer as well as has its own function that is needed at business unit layer. layer. And then on top, you have a company layer that subsumes the business unit and then whatever the function that is needed at a company level. So in the example that I just showed you, it has these type of subsumption layer. Lowest, it has the features and services. One above is the value proposition and above customer segment, and then the business unit. And then on the top, we have venture capital. Now, let's take a look at another example. This is a VC firm providing services to both B2B and B2C customers. Now, you have a product team delivering product and services to B2B customers. Once you are very successful with this offering, you add a marketing and sales team to reach more B2B customers. Now, your customer want more features and services. Then you add software team to provide more features. Next, you add a B2B customer segment team to provide multiple value proposition. And then have a B2B business unit subsuming B2B customer segment and business unit functionality that is needed at that layer. On the top, you have a VC unit subsuming the B2B business unit as well as the, uh, the functions that is needed at that uh, top VC company level layers. Now, you, this, this VC firm is expanding. So they are also uh, providing services to different customer group. In this case, let's say B2C customers. Now, then you have a product team delivering products for this completely different, you could say, uh, B2C customers. Then you have a customer segment team serving more providing multiple value proposition, and then the business unit subsuming the B2C customer segment, and then VC team uh, is subsuming both business unit, one for uh, that is the B2B and as well as B2C. Now let's talk about services like, since we are talking about this in an enterprise level, we also need to provide a service like compliances and governances and other functions like maybe the agile transformation and application and any other supporting part of the business. So where would those belong in this organization at an enterprise level? So you can also provide some of the specific need of any of these services for business unit, but then you can all, what, what is best because a lot of this thing is applied to all the business unit, it's best to serve it at, uh, that, at a, uh, the company level. So let's take a look at what kind of a subsumption layer that we have in this example, that the lowest again is the product and service and one above is the customer segment and then above is the business unit and then on top is the company. 
that is the subsumption layer that we have. Now, it is very important to point out what was used to divide this venture capital fund to subgroups. In the example that I just showed you, we used the customer segment as the base to group. Customer segment was used to divide the whole VC firm into subgroup, into parts. B2B customer segment was completely separated from the B2C. Now, you might ask why? Why use customer segment? Why not use other things to group it or segregate it? Why not use functional department or why not use by the product line? You think about it, this, this is kind of radical change. So the answer of that can be found from the two very influential thinkers, Peter Drucker and Clayton Christensen. Now, we all heard Peter Drucker's famous quote, quote saying that purpose of a business is to create a customer. Here, it is, I would like to point out that what he means by here customer, he's not talking about users. He's talking about paying customers. So he said this in 1950s. So I believe we still have a long way to follow his wise advice. So now we have made some progress by incorporating user stories, user journey mapping, story mapping, and user-centered design. But our focus has been more on serving the users, not particularly paying customers. And we still have not put customers, the paying customers in the center of the organization. Now, Clayton tells us a very important uh, importance of following the value network. He wanted to find out why best fund failed. So he did a very extensive study in it, uh, on it um, in his book. He talks about this value networks and not following this value network often leads the best funds failing in the face of disruptive innovation. So he chose a hard disk drive industry to study why best funds fail in the face of disruptive innovation. This study was done in 1990s. So at the time, hard disk drive was very fast moving industry. So he chose the disk drive industry after hearing a sales advice from a friend. His friend told them, those who study genetics avoid studying humans because it takes 30 years for a new generation to come along. Instead, they study fruit flies since they conceive, born, mature, die all within one day. So he suggested study disk drive. So why established firms fail in the face of disruptive innovation? Many think that it's because they don't have the right organizational and also culture to respond to the technology changes. And also they think that they don't have the ability to deal with the radical new technology. But Clayton said that history of this drive industry tells us a different story. Innovation happens only if customers need an innovation. If they don't want or need an innovation, it is impossible to sell even very simple innovations. Established firms fail not because they didn't develop the technology first. In fact, they were the first to develop the prototypes. This finding consistently showed that they failed because they were caught between two different value networks the existing customer's value network and emerging new customer value network. So the innovator's dilemma. So what is value network? It is about responding to the customers more holistically, looking at their needs, solving their problems, working with the suppliers, reacting to competitors, and striving for profit. In fact, we need to look at 
holistically and also vertically, including the suppliers and partners and distribution channels and so on. Often the value network for existing market is quite different from the emerging market. So let's take a look at uh, a needs for two different customers, desktop customers versus laptop customers. Desktop customers need more storage and faster speed over a size of a disk. Whereas laptop customers, they need small size over sm more storage and faster need speed. In fact, the laptop customers are willing to pay more money for small disk. You see, their needs are quite different. So if, if you have the same team serving both desktop customers and laptop customers, they will be competing for resources. Often the firm put the current customer's needs before the new market's customer needs. This is the reason that they need to be completely separated from each other. So why established firm fail in the face of innovation? They are held captive by their current customers. Listening to their customer often leads them to enter the disruptive industry late. This is the case where you shouldn't be listening to your customers. Now, it is also not a rational financial decision for the team to make investment, um, for the firm firms to make the investment and put the resources into the new and emerging market, because usually they have a lower margin and also lower profit, especially in the beginning of the uh, this emerging market. So by the time the established firm makes a strategic decision to enter the emerging market, it is too late. So this is why this organizational structure that I've shown you before, it is completely separated by B2B and B2C. Now let's talk about the next characteristic of the robotics architecture and learning from the past behavior. So how, how, does, how do we do this in a, uh, enterprise firm? Enterprise Scrum is based on Scrum. So three pillars of Scrum, in, uh, transparency, inspect and adapt, plays key role in here. In Scrum, we have a Scrum board for transparency. Now in Enterprise Scrum, we put this transparency uh, sort of on steroid. So how do we do that? We do that by having every team have uh, in the organization have a canvas to visualize what they do um, and, and then also making it visual, uh, uh, visible to other teams, other, everybody, not other in the organizational level. So let's take a look at what kind of a, a canvas that product uh, team would have. So this is a template. Suddenly you guys could change the way uh, what is needed for this product team. So this is very much like a business model canvas uh, as they are delivering value proposition for one customer segment. In this case, it's the B2B customer segment. Keep in mind what Clayton said about uh, the value network. So as you see, they need to be uh, aware of who are their suppliers <clears throat> As well as what are their pocket, uh, who are their partners, and then the the channels and and so on, so that they will look at it more holistically and vertically. Now let's take a look at what kind of uh, uh, canvas the marketing and sales team would have. This would be uh, this is again the template. So as you can see, this is different from the uh, canvas that you just saw, because they are more focused on serving the marketing and sales need for one customer segment. They don't, they, this is definitely not a functional uh, marketing and sales team. This, they only serve the B2B customer segment. 
and then they uh, uh, they know they need to know what you know whatever the important thing they need to know they would have it in their canvas as well as course and everything else. So you every single uh, team all the way to the uh, VC uh, the top company level they would have uh, canvas to to uh, know the all the important factors and all the items that they are working on and to make it more visible to others. So that's the transparency on steroid. So, uh, so also another thing to point out is that Mike always talk about uh, all at once management. So having all this visible and uh, allows uh, teams to have an, the organization to have an all at once management and uh, the Willow that uh, Dennis, uh, uh, his client, who uh, implement they implemented the uh, um, enterprise scrum. They use the uh, they have all these campuses, and then they use the SharePoint to uh, share their campuses. So now. The next characteristic of robotic subsumption architecture is the role of sensors and actuators. In Enterprise Scrum, the canvas that I just showed you plays a role, key role in here because um, they, 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 the canvases work like signals, sending signals because you would see what, uh, the, what kind of problems they might have. Um, and yeah, so I think that there is some help that we can get from the uh, the tools uh, to send some of the signals automatically as well. So now another key thing that puts all these things together that uh, the function like the um, um, the actuator that enables the uh, all the layers to interact with the physical world, we have something what's called servers. This works like surfers riding a wave as it serves. And in, other, in our case, surfers are riding waves from one team to another, and then act accordingly, depending on the situation. Uh, Dennis will talk more about this, how uh, the Villo did this. They use what's called collaborator, and it's pretty interesting. So canvases together with uh, surfers plays the role of sensors and actuator. Now, just like in Mobot, we do not have role of a central processor. That is that we don't have one person making decisions for the teams and teams are working together, making the appropriate decisions and act on their own level while listening and responding to the condition all at once. So let's talk about the benefits of using the subsumption architecture. Now, again, the first and most important benefit that we get is an autonomy. Actually, when I was preparing this slide, I was just gonna put autonomy, nothing else, because autonomy is the foundation of building agility in any organization. Without autonomy, all other benefits, it's very hard to be realized. Without autonomy, Agile at scale is not agile. Without autonomy, agile at scale is built on sand. It just shambles. So it is autonomy, autonomy, autonomy. That is why I named my company as AHA Autonomy. So in real estate, it's location and location, location. In scaling agile, I believe it's autonomy, autonomy, autonomy. Next benefit, all at once management through transparent, transparent communication. So having canvases to visual, visualize key items that each team needs to track, as well as making them visible to others. And also canvas together with the surfers enables the faster decision-making and enables all at once management. Next, decentralized decision-making. Even though this is hierarchical, it is there so that each team makes its own decision and then higher layer teams decide whether they need to subsume lower layer or disregard it depending on the situation they are in. 
All this enables faster time to market. Most of all, it brings a synergy with uh, and an alignment throughout the whole organization. As it, now, the teams are autonomous and self-managed. They are happy. Happy teams make happy customers. Happy teams and customers would make happy stakeholders. Lastly, it comes down to survival and profit. As you learn what Clayton studied and how good company fails in the face of disruptive innovation, you must follow value networks. And what I shown you in here in this presentation would kind of guide you to survive, especially in a volatile and uncertain, complex, ambiguous vodka market. Now let's hear from Dennis how Revilda implemented. So hi back guys. Uh, let's let's have a look about the company first, uh, in order to understand the implementation. So, uh, Livello uh, was approved in two thousand fourteen and uh, effectively launched in two thousand sixteen because of all the bureaucratic stuff and so on. And uh, Livello was born uh, with a link uh, of two of the biggest banks here in Brazil. It's called the uh, uh, Banco do Brasil, uh, Bank of Brazil, and uh, Bradesco. So if you want to have a look later, you can also search for it. And then after after the launch, uh, it, it began an expansion phase from 2017 on. And basically, after getting in contact with Mike Peter, we were al already applying effectively this, uh, uh, all these ideas about enterprise scrum and also subsumption architecture. Uh, from 2017 on, and uh, it's documented until 2000, uh, mid 2019, as I will show you. So we have also uh, data about about this case. So uh, it is uh, in so in 2018, uh, Livello was rated uh, third most profitable company and the 13th company which most grew uh, between the uh, thousand biggest companies here in Brazil. And uh, today, uh, when you uh, search for Livello, uh, Livello is one of the biggest loyalty reward uh, programs in Brazil. And the expansion phase was uh, almost uh, tripled the, the size of the, of the company. So let's, let's have a look in more detail. Um, how, uh, how did we uh, implement it? <laughs> yeah. So, before going into how, uh, maybe just just see what 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 they expected out of application of enterprise scrum and subsumption architecture. Uh, uh, what were the challenges and and the gains? So as every company uh, wants to foster, uh, Livello also wanted to uh, get better in the uh, three magical pillars of the technology, uh, together uh, with fidelity marketing and also foster their solutions. So uh, in detail, they uh, uh, wanted to have a better reaction uh, to change because at that time, especially the, the market uh, of the reward programs was not uh, very good regulated uh, from the government side. And it was many, many uh, uh, uncertainties also in the market and with the competitors. So they wanted to have a better reaction to change, uh, have a more empirical approach uh, also wanted to make a decentral decision making as Sue was talking about this. Uh, they had uh, one value stream uh, and uh, they basically <laughs> killed themselves in order to put uh, put these projects uh, one after the other into this value stream. But the, the reality was more complex than this. So they had uh, different customer segments. Uh, they had to attend with different uh, specific type of products and services. Uh, so they had to uh, do everything uh, in parallel and all, all at once. So they had, it was very important for them in order to um, uh, uh, make, to to att attend all uh, all all this reality of the company. And also, uh, they wanted to get loose of of their uh, more hierarchical structure also coming uh, from uh, from the banks, linked banks, yeah. Uh, by, by their creation, so they, they they knew it, and then also 
they wanted to uh, focus on people uh, with together with their products but also people uh, from from their clients users and also uh, people inside of the company of the collaborators and especially when we when we look at the uh, people focus we could uh, we could have a uh, very very big uh, uh, achievements and gains so on the on the right side we see for example uh, what uh, what this brought as the gains for the uh, for the people the collaborators so they could uh, measure uh, less hierarchy uh, more uh, collabor daily basis collaboration and better collaboration between all different type of knowledge layers, uh, the, the the functional silos, business IT, and everybody needed collaborated more. They could uh, measure also a better personal development, also people knowing more about other knowledge layers uh, uh, it was, it was structured in these functional silos and people were uh, not not knowing a lot about the other uh, domain uh, knowledge domains needed in order to bring bring the value also could uh, implement a celebration culture in order to uh, yeah uh, uh, celebrate uh, about the the outcomes and what the, they could they could deliver a value delivery and also could create a better environment in in, in types of uh, uh, facilities better facilities workplaces less uh, less noise uh, for the uh, during during the work and also uh, could implement a, a effective feedback culture. We have, for example, a, a case, a best case here. Uh, for example, uh, we will uh, we are we were asking people directly about their ex uh, collaborators' experience, and there was uh, someone uh, from from the software teams, for example, uh, appointed uh, some. Uh, um some critical point about the manager and the manager wanted the, the name of this collaborator so we we were uh, stand we had a, a turning point we said okay when we when we open uh, the anonymity of this we will we will break the uh, the trust system uh, and uh, it was uh, the anonymity was kept and the uh, and this was very good for uh, for all 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 the people. Yeah? This was for, uh, one example of the feed, uh, active feedback culture that we that we could implement. So we asked everybody, and also in uh, uh, almost all all other domains, when we see the expected side, we could see also um, um, that we could attend more more than expected. For example, we could have uh, more scalability. Uh, better communication, velocity of communication, time to market was uh, was better. Also, uh, we could uh, we could measure more more productivity. So this uh, the the balance was very very positive uh, for the level. So let let's let's go to the to the next slide and see a bit uh, more in detail how uh, did we apply the subsumption uh, architecture at level. So. Uh, let's remember also uh, not forget about uh, all these discussions about subsumption architecture. Uh, um, it has, of course, its origins from Rodney Brooks and with the robotics uh, and so on. But also, we were discussing a lot. Uh, so will remember, remember this in the co uh, collaborators community and also in the uh, enterprise scrum community about subsumption and uh, Mike Beadle. Uh, was telling us that subsumption is uh, in the context of uh, business agility, a collaboration of different knowledge layers uh, together. Uh, so, uh, how did we do this uh, in order to bring uh, bring all this reality as a model inside of the day 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 by day work of the uh, of the team? So we we created tribes. <laughs> so don't don't understand wrong uh, uh, the terminology tribes. Uh, they, were, they 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 didn't implement the uh, uh, the Spotify <laughs> Spotify model. They called it tribes, but uh, actually the tribes uh, would would mean the business units, um, and uh, all these business units uh, uh, were attending uh, one specific customer segment. Uh, for example, we had uh, in the first configuration uh, uh, five. Uh, business units and for example we had uh, a business unit attending uh, b2c uh, customer segment another uh, business unit attending b2b customer segment and also other uh, business units uh, attending other customer segments 
So, um, and then in, inside of, uh, after creating the stripes, we subsumed, and uh, we make the subsumption uh, to all uh, software teams that were loose un until this point, uh, loose in the company, attending uh, basically, uh, no, yes, uh, attending basically uh, not, not with a, 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 a good connection and a good purpose, um, uh, like a, a loose demands. And then uh, the software teams were subsumed inside of the business units uh, in order to uh, build and run the products and services needed uh, for the specific customer segments inside of the business units. And also we subsumed all other uh, structures like departments and uh, all other structures which had interdependencies uh, to the, uh, in order to create uh, the value for the customer segment in, uh, inside of the specific uh, business unit. We also subsumed other structures. This meant in, uh, in reality that uh, people uh, were uh, uh, delocated. <laughs> they were working inside of their functional silos, for example. So they had to go out there and uh, work on a day, day by day basis inside of the uh, inside of the tribe together with all the other knowledge layers. So this is the uh, the first um, uh, details, and then we will go in more detail in the next slide. So go, let's go to the, to the next slide to have, ah, okay. So, um, but then in order to, uh, to implement the subsumption architecture, we had to uh, uh, need some, some help. Uh, and then uh, that's why we applied uh, a thing called open information system uh, in order to uh, create this um, cycles of, of evolution of the, of the tribes and all the other, uh, all the other instances uh, and, and, and canvases that we create. So we, we, we created the tribes, the business units, um, which included all the needed knowledge layers uh, in order to um, make the uh, effective collaboration on day, day by day basis. And then the idea was uh, to deliver value to the specific customer segment. Yeah? And then after the value delivery, after the, uh, the cycle, we uh, asked uh, feedback. Uh, we, we got uh, feedback from customers, users uh, in a direct and indirect way. And also, uh, in, very important, we asked also feedback to the collaborators. Uh, we will get into, into this later more, in more detail. And then um, regarding all, all these feedbacks received as data inside of the open information uh, system that we had, we could make uh, adaptations uh, for the next cycle. Uh, this could, for example, uh, include or exclude some specific type of knowledge layer, uh, people from uh, some type of functional silos that had to be subsumed. For example, we could make some, some adaptation like this in order to be uh, better, uh, uh, less interdependent and had, uh, had everybody uh, um, there in order to uh, uh, be able to uh, deliver all, all this value all at once to the to this customer segment. So in this tribes, we had all these people together. Uh, and the idea was uh, that all at once and end to end, uh, the value delivery had to be done inside of the tribes, not dependent of uh, any other uh, structures inside of the company because they were subsumed inside of, of the tribe and all, all, the, all the others other structures also. So we had in this tribe different knowledge layers, uh, people uh, from different uh, uh, functional, functional silos uh, inside of the tribe, people from business, products, development, uh, security, fraud, marketing, finance, commercial, HR, uh, everybody who was needed in order to uh, bring this uh, specific value uh, to this customer segment inside of the business units. So we could uh, cut these dependencies and uh, work together on a daily day uh, on a daily basis, um, and, and not in this in the functional silos, but inside of a network, uh, in a, inside of a sense making sense making network uh, for these people because they knew for whom they were delivering with uh, what type of value and 
what they were working on and uh, what what their work would contribute to the uh, to the satisfaction uh, of these specific customers. Uh, and then uh, also uh, in 2019, uh, so almost uh, uh, eight months later, also Priscilla Costa, uh, she was the uh, CFO of Livello at that time. She was also presenting uh, uh, the uh, 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 evolution of the Livello case in 2019 at Agile Trends. Also, she's she's bringing the same uh, uh, the same system that we implemented in from 2017 on, uh, also a more refined and more uh, uh, also more uh, intrused system of uh, of this uh, open information system with the subsumption architecture. So let's see more details. Okay, challenges. Let's go to the challenges. Okay. So let's uh, look at what kind of challenges uh, that you might have, or we have seen uh, implementing the subsumption architecture. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so the first, uh, like any, you know, the agile shift, uh, we find that the biggest challenge that we see is the paradigm shift. See, you know, we moved away from the functional silo to the feature teams and then, then to the product teams, but completely shifting to an organization that is centered around customer segment, uh, or customer-centered organization, it's still a very hard sell. Um, there are very few organizations that are structured this way. But as you heard, and then as I kind of share, I mean, this book, it goes much, much more in detail. I just kind of highlight some of the key things that he mentions in that Innovator's Lemma book. I encourage all of you to uh, read that book. Actually, especially you guys in the uh, West Coast, in the Silicon Valley, this probably a lot of guys, you already probably read that book. Um, so as he showed, history showed again and again and again, best firms left behind because they failed because they didn't follow the value network. So I believe that, you know, it must be segregated, especially if you are in uh, innovative uh, technology. So next challenge that we see is when to apply this subsumption architecture. Because at what point, because all the product goes through the you know, product life cycle. So it starts, so when do you interject this uh, subsumption architecture? Another challenge, I think this is probably the biggest, but I, we believe that the best way to subsume that is again using the customer segment as the base of the subsumption. So, uh, but then if you, but then I think that what's the reality is that you have other things like maybe your company is serving internationally, then it, perhaps you need to combine those different uh, factors, design factors, and to make this to really work. So, one of the biggest challenges that uh, we had is to uh, get to this uh, collaborator's experience because uh, who, who, who already saw the HBR article about the IBM case of the collaborator's experience, uh, we know from this case on that the collaborator's experience has an impact of two thirds on the uh, customer experience. So we have to focus on the uh, collaborators experience also. So we had this collaborators Andon. Andon, uh, the word Andon comes from the lean, lean management, and basically means that this traffic, traffic lights inside of uh, uh, one, 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 one group or a team indicating problems and, uh, uh, and, and uh, things that should, should have a focus uh, from, from the management side. 
so uh, in, uh, also we, we, so this is also a, a political question right uh, what about this this uh, thinking about the sensor part that um, sue was talking about um and in a more tailoristic behavior would be uh, the the sensing part uh, like a, a, a system with a bug right so uh, would be some maybe some managers uh, making the sensing part and then telling uh, to the collaborators uh, uh, more on the acting side that they should only act. But uh, in this subsumption uh, behavior and agile behavior, we could say that we could have to foster uh, the sensing part of the collaborators. Uh, and so we, for example, asked them, every, literally every, everybody who participated in the tribes and all the subsumed, uh, subsumed uh, instances uh, inside of the company, we, make the uh, collaborators undone and uh, ask actively uh, all the people about uh, problems, uh, other uh, feedback uh, they, uh, they, they could give. Also, uh, we, for example, in, in this case, we used uh, uh, in the three, three domains, uh, purpose, mastery, and autonomy. And, and uh, free, free feedback also that uh, the people would give. So, uh, this was actually uh, after that uh, input in, inside of the uh, open information system, uh, this, this experience. So this so the data that was available uh, from the collaborators experience was not uh, uh, was not a, 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 like somebody else put put this in in order to uh, act later, but the, the, the proper people uh, would input, uh, all this data inside of the system. So it's it's very important, uh, the collaborators and on. Uh, it's a challenge. It's a, also a political question inside uh, inside of the company. So let's go to the to the next challenge also. Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, like many, many years, uh, the discussion is going on. Um, and inside of the community, also with some many friends of, of mine discussing about the, uh, the demos teams. It's uh, some in some cases very difficult to understand, but I think it's a central point, critical point also to understand the, uh, what was Mike talking about the demos teams. So uh, demos is for uh, self-directed, self-managed, self-organized, and uh, very important, the self-selected, uh, team. So for Mike Wieland, Scrum always meant this, but uh, uh, if, we, if we see in the reality many times, you cannot uh, guarantee this, and especially the self-selection uh, of the team uh, also has uh, in, 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 the, in reality many, many bugs and it gets a political problem also uh, to lead with the dependency. So in this subsumption architecture, the demos uh, certainly is one of the uh, critical points in order to everybody understand this uh, from from all, all the people uh, involved in, uh, in in the in the process and also uh, important to understand about uh, resonant agility. Yeah? Uh, many times we asked about uh, agility: is this for everyone uh, or only about uh, with the software developers and so on? But uh, the understanding of Mike Beadle uh, about resonant agility, the agility he believes in is that agility is resonant to the people. So it's a natural thing and everybody should uh, be able to uh, find himself, uh, connect himself uh, inside of the of this open information system, inside of the subsumption and uh, co collaborate with his uh, certain uh, knowledge domain in order to uh, be uh, useful and helpful uh, to attend the specific customer and uh, uh, needs and uh, deliver deliver the value for, for this. so we can basically apply also for any uh, any contexts uh, the resonant agility it's also very important to to understand okay and then uh, next next slide so let's talk about the what are the advantages and the benefit that the below um, have. So um, when we uh, some of the some of the benefits we can see also in context of the changes that develop uh, under under 
uh, was at that time. So the value almost uh, doubled at uh, the size uh, of the company, also doubled the size of uh, of the teams, of the tribes, of the software teams, of of uh, every every structure. So as new people uh, were entering, also uh, the, the 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 instances, yeah, the the tribes and and all the all the other structures, um, and when, when we, for example, look at the quotation of, of James Coplin uh, in a scrum book, the rule of thumb, he says that every new person detracts from the effectiveness of everyone else in the team about about 25% for the next six months. Uh, so we should uh, expect the uh, chaos and uh, and uh, lose of uh, product productivity and other indicators, but uh, with the application of the subsumption architecture and the enterprise scrum ideas, uh, we, we uh, contrary to this what was expected, we could see that the uh, uh, new uh, um, coming coming people should uh, rapidly integrate it themselves inside of the, uh, the 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 system, and also we could see, for example, uh, uh, when we see, for example, the scrum values. We could see also uh, benefits. Uh, contrary to to James Coplin, we, we saw more alignment uh, of of people regarding vision plans. They also did less parallel work, could have more 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 focus, be be more open. Uh, also, uh, we could see more participation in inside of the tribes, the business units, and less participation in the in the functional silos. Uh, we could see also people making less anonymous posts uh, with the time the time passing have more confidence in the whole system. Uh, also uh, could see, for example, uh, more collaboration between different types of uh, peoples with different type of knowledge layers and also uh, have less cumulative roles and responsibilities. So we, uh, we could see that the, the system uh, was a uh, more natural way for for people and got a good good acceptance and people uh, could uh, integrate themselves and into this uh, sense making network and also uh, bring their their active collaboration uh, for the value delivery. Okay, so let's go to the next one. And also, uh, let's go back to this ideas about the uh, collaborators and on. Uh, also, when we uh, let's re remember Mike Beadle talking about all hierarchy uh, should be uh, in, in subsumption. So what to do, for example, with the company level, yeah? the venture capital le level that Sue was talking about. Uh, so uh, as, as lack of... Uh, 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 some other options uh, as an uh, MVP. Yeah? We just uh, input the, the data from the collaborators and on the collaborators experience inside of the uh, company company canvas. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, first of first of all, we wanted to the C level and the company uh, company level uh, subsumption also to to subsume and uh, get the sensors. Uh, about uh, what were what were the experience of the of the collaborators inside of all these business units and all the other structures that we we had subsumed. So uh, with these with these inputs, we could uh, make effective and rapid rapid decisions of the C level. For example, investment decisions in order to make the uh, make a better experience for the for the collaborators. So. Uh, for example, new communication tools were were bought re uh, fa fastly in order to uh, enable the telepresence of of all the tribes and and teams, for uh, because people were working in different states and, and even people working abroad uh, inside of the tribes. So uh, this was very very uh, costly, but this this was uh, made this investment was made as a subsumption of the of this uh, the business units and the other structures implemented. Uh, existing structures were adjusted, facilities uh, could, could get better uh, in order to uh, guarantee less noise, the people had more places and uh, all, all these things that they were pointed out inside of the collaborators and on could, uh, could be included inside of, uh, of this, for example, these investment decisions. 
Also, they uh, created, for example, uh, integration bodies in order to make a better integration of the new, uh, new collaborators. Also, uh, internal and external uh, paid trainings about uh, ev everything appointed also inside of the collaborators and ons business IT trainings process framework and also adjustments could be uh, could made in the uh, form of work in the in the framework so it was also important uh, to subsume as an MVP directly the company uh, company level uh, uh, directly to the to this uh, as a sub subsumption also to, to the top Okay. So thank you for that. Um, so what we just covered today was just some part of the enterprise scrum, especially how enterprise scrum apply the subsumption architecture. As uh, we went over, right? It's there are different pieces that is working together. First, most important thing is those layers, and then you we have the canvases. And then we have the surface. Those all three has to work together, just like the way um, you know the robotics architecture works. That for them to be autonomous. And there are a lot more in enterprise scrum. I just we you know there's structural pattern that can help you with uh, scaling. And most of all, uh, what Mike did was that he made this. Uh, for business agility. So uh, Ola, a lot of terms that was used in, uh, that is used in Scrum, like uh, uh, um, sprint, right? But not all business uh, works on the sprint. So we call it like cycles. And then we don't call it a uh, product owner, we call it business owner. So there are, he, he cleaned up a lot of terminology because Terminology is also very important because that gives the shared understanding of what we are all doing together. So another thing with Enterprise Scrum is that it is pluggable and configurable. So um, now, so there's still a lot more to do. And then in terms of the subsumption, of, you know, um, applying the subsumption architecture, there are a lot more that we can expect, you know, we can we can make it better uh, to make it more automated. Um, so now the you can some of the like basic information about enterprise scrum can be found on my website, which is www.ahaautonomy.com. And also some of the information is found on Dennis's website, which is uh, shown in, in there. So uh, this is, this went over a lot longer than uh, what we thought. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, I thank you very much for listening to all this until now. So I'd like to open this up and we'd like to find out how this might work, open up the whole, uh, uh, the you know, the people in on the June session now, how might this would work for your organization and any of the questions uh, that you might have. I look like Alex. Has I, a yes, but actually, I would like to compliment uh, both uh, uh, Dennis and Sue for this presentation and reminder also of the great mind of Mike Beadle, that used to be also my teacher and mentor. And uh, to your question here, I'm, uh, yeah, thank you so much. And I don't know, I don't see everyone on the panel, so maybe there's other friends. Uh, it, I'm touched, I'm really touched for, for this, and I really enjoy this. That's a reminder of uh, the greatness that we could do together as a group also. And uh, especially in the world of chaos, we are now with the VUCA on steroids that we should transform that VUCA into more decentralized decision and substantion. It's very important. As he used to say in Berlin in October 2017, if you don't understand substantion, you don't understand Scrum. So how could you actually help your Scrum team or, or develop further? And I think, yes, you had the, the question, how do you apply it into your organization? Um, it's quite challenging. Uh, for the last three, four years, I tried to bring just the enterprise scrum as we, we learned from Mike. And it's quite a challenge in face of these big, uh, scale agile framework and all of the, you know, the big buzzword, unfortunately, that 
that we have. So we need more people like you, Sue, and, and Denise to come up with uh, another way, a divergent way of doing this uh, decentralization uh, of uh, scaling agile and uh, substantial hierarchy. It's one of the things that, yes, we try to implement, but it's kind of hard because the mindset that's uh, people still need some kind of, uh, yeah, they call it safe for a reason. It's a great story for engineer and they buy it and they love that story. So now we have to find a way to tell our story. And I think this one, uh, it's really refreshing using robotics. I think uh, maybe our yes. the left and the right brain will work together finally in conscious agility. Yes. That's my I, I think that um, subsumption, all those parts that I was mentioning, that, you know, the layers and then the, um, the sensors, and then actuator, they all work together. And I think in a, for to bring an agility in an organization, we need to do the similar things as we yeah. have shown as what might kind of put together. So, um, and I, I, you know, and then what Denise's uh, company, uh, Denise, the client, they actually did it and um, it, 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 it's working really well for them. So, okay. Ron, you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, and, and I want to point out that if you want to queue up to ask a question, uh, use the raise hand, uh, use the raise hand button uh, in the uh, along the bottom of the Zoom uh, window. My my question is, so in the robotics model, the the brain, uh, the brain decide the brain is is at the top layer and decides what to do. Um, in in uh, and Dennis, I'm going to ask you this about um, uh, about the company in Little uh, uh How 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 are those? I presume product decisions are made at the top level and and somehow work their way down, uh, as opposed to being made at the at the uh, smallest team level. Is that the case? So, but before he answers it, and I would yeah, I think that's very excellent question that you asked because. Um, as I was going through that they are layered, you know, and then, but then the key thing that we need to uh, be aware of is that, that it gets, robot gets so many different signals and they don't always process all those signals. And then they all have each part place there its role. And it's not the brain controls how to walk. They, they have some other functions, they have some other goal they need to achieve, and then it uses it. So I think that's the key thing. It's not that you are waiting for the top layers to making a decision. It, it depends on the situation that, that it is. And so uh, I hope I, I didn't confuse you more. Yeah. So if I can, if I can throw yeah. the thing that kept popping up in my mind as I was mm -hmm. playing the question, I didn't add, I didn't, I didn't uh, include, which is, the notion of OKRs mm. is is sort of that process of the highest level mm. OKR and everyone inherits from that. And it's a very layer oriented. It's a very done well. It's mm. seldom done well, OKRs, but done well, they're they're mm. as layered as I think what you were describing. So mm -hmm. let me let me yeah. I think as uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but there is some uh, the mob program. Somebody of you guys know this mock programming. Uh, it was literally like this. So they had uh, uh, facilities where for 50 people uh, could maybe 20 would be present and the others were uh, in the telepresence. So uh, basically the decisions were made uh, always all together. So for example, um, there, there was uh, no OKRs were implemented, but there were a lot of KPIs and uh, metrics and uh, other indicators uh, important uh, for the for the specific customer segment. Also, uh, they they had real data about uh, uh, asking real customers and uh, about their experience and also inputting this data and also the collaborators' experience also inside of the system. So they had. All this information and um, basically make these decisions. Uh, the next next steps for 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 example, what what step to do in the evolution of of this product, this service. This was made all uh, 
uh, all together. So all, everybody had uh, some more the, like a democratic way of could uh, raise hands, make some questions, uh, give give also uh, their feedback. So everything was uh, uh, very 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 connected. You know, uh, this this was the way that uh, basically they did everything. And actually the the sea level also after the subsumption. Uh, of the company canvas with the sea level people also they they go inside of uh, this like this mop mop room of this of this business unit tribe room and also were, were present there together with the software developers and everybody was subsumed inside of uh, of the business unit so uh, it was something like this M many people thought uh, that it would not be so so productive but uh, actually, it was very good because they, they could they could show that they uh, take the right decisions and could uh, evaluate in the experience of their customers and, and users. I don't know if this, this was okay. To... So one of, one of the one of the rules of product management, and, uh, and I'm probably going to mangle this, but one of the rules of product management is that. Um, Yes, we listen to our customers, but we don't let our customers tell us. We let our customers, we, we try to drill through what our customers tell us they want to understand what their problem is. And uh and and we and product management is a very is a is a very um uh, grown skill set to translation of pro uh, to to bringing to to getting to drilling through those uh, I want a faster horse to oh you want an automobile, or, or oh, oh you want a more uh, easier to use DOS to oh we want a Macintosh, uh, right? I mean that's that's product management. So how does that fit into this whole uh, scheme? So um, again, like one of the way that is organized, as I was saying, that it's completely segregated by the customer segment, right? So uh, that, so that like what Clayton was talking about with the value network, that you mix those teams together up, then, then usually they will be competing for the resources and many other things. And then not only that, you don't look at the whole uh, the, the 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 value network that is that the you know who are your suppliers and because depending on who supplies it because like for the example that I was giving you was with the uh, the hard disk and the laptop right and the people who make the su suppliers of hard disk has a different you have a different suppliers for that and for the laptop you have another different so if you uh, one of the way that 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 Mike's way of solving that problem is the segregation. Um, yeah. But that doesn't answer my question about product management at all. Mm. Why? What do you mean? So, well, if you look at if you look, so one of my examples was seeing seeing people say, uh, you know, mm. uh, DOS sucks. And uh, and Steve Jobs, being an Uber product manager, saying, "Let's let's adapt what they did on the Star." And so they've got one customer segment, which is consumers, mm. and and they were very focused on consumers. Uh, and you know, they had an education segment too, but they were very focused on consumers. Um, and uh, and did that translation at the very top. To say we need to we we need to we need to do something entirely different that is going to truly solve these people's problem. Mm. So your example is that how Microsoft would pro uh, develop a product like what Steve Jobs did. Yeah, well, Microsoft only copied, but but um, so they did a terrible job of it. Actually, they did Steve Jobs really was copied from the Xerox. To, yes, yes, but but Microsoft copied from Apple and then took until yeah. three point one to actually do it successfully. So they were they were much 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 worse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and Steve didn't copy the star. He adapted everything mm -hmm. he saw over there at Xerox. Mm -hmm. Actually, his his team did. Mm -hmm. So in very in, in a very real way, that team was. Mm -hmm very agile like at the bottom level because they're mm -hmm. all working from 
uh, from a vision. The vision came from the top. The vision came from Steve, but the but the the working uh, elements all came from the bottom. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, uh, and, and it Dennis, looks you wanna... like it looks like Alex maybe may want to respond to that, or did you have a separate question? No, no. it's uh it's on product management with the permission of Sue. If I can uh, just add yeah, to your ahead. question, Ralph. Uh, with my experience uh, trying to implement this type of subsention model uh, within uh, from top level vision and value of customer and customer feedback loops, we have to remember that on the challenge that Sue presented it before and, and product management, if you have a clear product goal and if you use, as you mentioned yourself, Ron, the OKR that already a kind of a Marushka type of, of thing with the objective and different key and everything. So, so you already have it like naturally. And um, when we saw, when, if we still talk about Steve Job, uh, Elon Musk, or uh, mm -hmm. the guy from Amazon or uh, Bezos, uh, they don't talk about uh, all of these systems or they don't brag about doing Kanban, Scrum, uh, XP or whatever. They just do it, you know? So they have a clear vision. They invite people to work with them, not for them. And they make it happen whatever the way you talk about uber uh type of yes steve job as a character but these are the winners because they have systems and goals are for losers so the goal is not like every little bit of this the sub subsension it's it's about like making a whole thing so so i don't know for me what i've seen today it's kind of reinviting me to revisit uh the okrs and product management to apply it from the c level all the way to uh, the uh, the designer, the producer, uh, those who make the work, because for me, it's no more top down, bottom up. It's have to be a, a circular collaboration, but with the subsension. This is the key. I think it will help you to do a spiraling from the top down and from bottom up again with the feedback loop. And I think that's what we learned, Sue, and with Mike and Enterprise Chrome. That's what I remember as well that the customer feedback, the people first over process tools and everything, that is exactly that kind of feedback loop. And for those who know physics, because I share a common thread with Mike, uh, I'm also, I'm a dropout of physics. He did his PhD, I didn't. Uh, I stopped at the master, but when we do physics, we understand that kind of interrelation of mm -hmm. now the atom, but if you replicate it into a business model with a visual business canvas, it's magic the magic happened there. And for product management is the same thing because in the canvas, you could have a specific value proposition for the, uh, the, the product enabler and that's go up and down and information going in, information going out and you you make it like, I think it's my five cents. If, uh, and please okay. do correct me if I did, if no, I said no, no, something that's, wrong. That's, but... uh, okay, so I think uh, we just have about a minute left uh, for this. Nope. And yeah, Ron, I mean, I think that I, perhaps I didn't quite uh, explain the the necessity of segregating uh, customer segment and and also how all these uh, canvases, that how those things are interlinked together to make what Mike says all at once management style, because that enables the teams and whole organization to respond to whatever the changes that needs to happen. So um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so then, so we do have the step that, that we just presented. So if you guys want, uh, I'm, we are more than welcome to share that with you guys. It looks like Dennis wanted to add something. Yeah, Ron, not everybody has a, a Steve Jobs inside of the, the <laughs> company so but what uh, what do we gain with the the subsumption architecture is this like uh, alex told the uh, connectedness of the uh, of, of the group interdisciplinary inter so of course there will be people from product management also sitting inside uh, together with all the other knowledge layers but important to uh, the system which can receive all the all the inputs from from all the knowledge layers and can uh, make a, a, a good decision uh, for, for the future. I think this is uh, maybe uh, 
uh, the, the thing that you don't have the Steve Jobs, you have you have maybe the subsumption architecture to help you. <laughs> Mm. Uh, there was a note on one of your slides that the, uh, the uh, regarding the Philippe Pontieri um, presentation that there was a URL to it. Uh, yes, you can share uh, the, you, if you could share the URL. Yeah, I uh, I can share it here, but it's, it's in the slides also. Uh, um, all the slides have the links. Do you want me to share now? Uh, well, the the slides when they're presented through Zoom are not uh, are not live. Uh, yeah, uh, so it, uh, actually, if you pasted it into the comments on the meetup, uh, then everyone then uh, then everyone who who uh, comes to the meetup page will be able to find them. Okay, that would, and that would be really good. And then you're not going to do it right this moment. Um, so All I right. think we are at the end of our time, Mary. So, uh, um, Dennis and Sue, thank you so much for presenting this. This is so interesting. Uh, also, if there's if there's a book or a source, and and maybe it's your maybe it's ahaautonomy.com, yes, a source for actually for for reading or following through on this um, uh, on on this approach, that would be that would be uh, really awesome. Yeah. Uh, so on the, on the website, the website the there's well. the. I'm sorry, Ron. The, yeah, you can get the uh, what my course at uh, Enterprise Scrum definition and that has it's it's kind of dry read but it has some basic uh, information about what he was uh, talking about and you can always reach out to us uh, if you have more questions so um, you if you you know I, I was going to share our contact information do you guys have the contact information uh, uh, that would be great. And also doing that, uh, doing that on the meetup in the meetup page comments would be a, a great place to put those. Okay. Well. Yes, I will uh, share and, the and link. Alex, to... Alex, as a as a user, you might want to you you might want to add yours as well if you are willing to be contacted. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Ron. Anytime. Thank you so much, Denise, Sue, and everyone, and yeah. to Ron and uh, Mary to uh, so making that space. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so much for presenting. It's just really thank you really so much. Thank you so much for your interest. And still, there's a lot more work to be done, but I think right. it's very beneficial. Yeah, Mike yes. Beetle's uh, my, what Mike Beetle wants from Scrum, what he what his belief set is, is just such a great match for what we all should be hoping for. I think. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Thanks. <clears throat> Oops. So, uh, Mary, can you hear me? Okay. So, I think um, people didn't understand Ron's point, which mm -hmm. was that um, uh, Jobs was trying to basically figure out what we would now call the minimum viable product. Uh huh. And he didn't get it right the first time. He did the Lisa before he did the Macintosh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's um it's some part of it is vision, which is how he interpreted, but some yeah. part of it is persistence and understanding yeah. and the role of character, although that didn't really come up, right? How much yeah. commitment do you have to getting it right? So Jobs, yeah. when he when he moved over to uh, Pixar, mm -hmm. I mean, he did like 11 different versions of Toy Story. Yeah. And, and there's a famous story about how um, Larry Ellison just didn't give a shit about yeah. the 11th improvement. But Jobs was obsessive about getting yeah. it exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And so it turned out that there was a side effect that he did that people didn't understand, uh, and mm -hmm. and Ron didn't bring it up. Yeah, well, thank you for and the that, feedback. Um, um, and maybe we can talk about it in the next one or another time. But unfortunately, I have to run to another meeting. So. Oh, I'm sorry <laughs> for holding you back. <laughs> That's 
All right. All I right. appreciate your feedback, but have a good day. It was written. Thank you so much for joining. Sure. All right. Bye-bye.